Could we have roll call? Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Weber? Here. Ms. Lomas? Here. Mr. Bullock? Here. Mr. Moldaver? Here. Thank you. I'm here. Oh. here. <laughs> Ms. French? Here. <laughs> okay, did everybody have a chance to review the minutes who was here last month? Uh, move to accept the uh, draft minutes of the May meeting as presented. I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? I abstain. Thank you, Ms. French. Okay, any adjustments to the agenda this evening? No. Moving on then, any public comment? Seeing none. I, I've, yes? I've got one. Uh, I just wanted to share with the community what um, former Chair Weber was sharing with the committee, which was that uh, she presided over a very, very successful outdoor garden party for a favorite local charity and entertained several hundred people in, in high style after uh, months of planning and hard work. So I want to commend her for that with her entire team. It was a good party. <laughs> Any committee member and staff communications? No. All right, then we move right along to our business items. First, water quality. We have Jill Murray, our water quality research coordinator here, and she has a presentation for us to consider. Yes, thank you. Um, I generally come at least twice a year, with those two times being once to give you the annual report and then in June to give you the research plan for the coming fiscal year and give you a mid-year update on water quality results. Um, so I'll start with the really basic overview of um, what we do with our monitoring and talk about um, the changes to the plan from the previous year, from FY14. And the I'm not going to go into all the details, which samples we're collecting and which from which sites, but you have that in the um, packet that you were given. There were a few extra pages included in that packet by accident. So really what I wanted you to see is just the, the table. There's some text following it that was I held over from last year by accident. Um, and then I'll go into some results, uh, some interesting results on beach warnings and some storm monitoring results, an update on the bird refuge, and then finish with our next steps. This, you all know this very well, but this is for um, people watching that haven't seen a presentation about our research and monitoring program before. Um, the goals of our program are to quantify the types and amounts of pollution, understand what their impacts are, so that's comparing them to known benchmark and benchmarks and standards um, in terms of impacts on aquatic organisms or swimmers, recreational impacts. Evaluate the effectiveness of the projects that we've installed and collect baseline data for our upcoming projects. And then, you know, as, if we know a project is coming, even if it's a few years um, ahead, we'll try to collect as much baseline data as we can and as reasonable. Uh, once we know we have a pollution problem, we'll um, try to identify the sources, and that'll be relevant for one of my topics later. We're always trying to uh, maintain a long-term data set so we can track long-term changes. And we also have, in the, in the last two years, we've had um, a more onerous uh, grant monitoring requirements or monitoring for our grants, and then um, increased uh, general permit requirements. And we're still working out exactly how we're going to meet those new regulations. And in all, all the time, we're trying to um, collect all this information so that we can strategize and prioritize for future projects and communicate with the public effectively about um, pollution issues. We, our program is very question driven. We try to never collect a single sample that we don't have a reason to be collecting and adaptable. And we're always changing um, as needed our sampling strategies and plans. And there's, there's some questions that are maintained in the research plan that we may not, might not even have touched in the last year, but there are questions that we still have and we want to get to. So we leave them in there. Changes for um, this year, we are We've had to update the permit compliance section to include, um, we call it the PIP. It stands for Performance Evaluation Assessment and Identification Plan. This was um, a section of the general permit that really escaped most um, 
phase two jurisdictions radars. It wasn't in the monitoring section, but upon hearing presentations from the regional board, it's clear that they're expecting a, a pretty large effort. And so we're going to try to um, meet with them in the coming year and really figure out what would be the best. We're, we're pretty different from a lot of the other phase twos, and so we want to um, see what would be the best approach for, for the city of Santa Barbara. We have two uh, sites that we'll start collecting more um, data for, the, the Arroyo Burrow at Barger Canyon restoration site and um, what may become part of the Mission Lagoon restoration project, which is a channel that's between El Estero wastewater treatment plant and the railroad tracks. We'll be collecting data from there and seeing if uh, we can inform that design. And part of our, um, part of the permit monitoring that we've already gotten approval from the regional board, we are going to increase the sampling frequency of a couple of our previously installed projects, our Hope and Haley low flow diversion projects. We're, uh, the sampling is something we've been doing every year. We're just going to collect um, quarterly instead of biannually. And we're going to um, collect a lot more flow data because, and we're going to use level loggers there. Um, we can leave them out in the creeks and then bring them in every few months, download the data, and look at the flow patterns. And that's because um, of our infiltration projects they're used in, and also uh, the Barger Canyon, the Las Positas, Mid Las Positas, all of those designs may depend on um, flow and fluctuations in flow. At the golf course, um, we've been looking at treatment effects from different sections of the golf course restoration project, and we've looked at upstream downstream effects. Now we're going to start studying more of the um, patterns of infiltration and evaporation and then looking at uh, the total loads of pollutants that are um, removed or kept from the creeks during storm events. That, and that, was, um, that change was made in, develop, in talking with um, George Thompson, who's in charge of that project. And then we've, we talked about this before, um, but we're going to move our general first flush monitoring where we just um, sample for kind of everything under the sun at our four main integrator sites. We have uh, a lot of data now. We know, we know which compounds we need to worry about, um, but we're going to keep sampling for uh, pesticides that either they're emerging pesticides or, or other compounds or the tests are new or if they've been suggested to be an environmental problem, we'll um, definitely keep testing for some of those. And then from um, our source tracking section, we finished, UCSB really finished, and we just helped with the Arroyo source tracking project, which you heard about at the last meeting. And then we're going to add three projects. Um, I'm going to submit a grant for some wet weather human marker testing, so that will only be pending grant funding. Um, <laughs> and Yeah, right. Funding and wet weather, good point. And um, some continuation, some updating of his, some historical uh, bacteria analysis, data analysis that we, we will do in partnership with UCSB. And they are conducting a microbial aging study, UCSB is, and we will just be kind of um, keeping abreast of that and helping them if, if uh, needed. And I'm on the uh, technical advisory committee for that project. So moving on to some selected results. Um, You've all heard a lot about drought, but um, just wanted to point out that it's had an effect on, on beach water quality. And this is a refresher. The county is required by the state law, AB 411, to sample many beaches in the county, including four from in, within the city, uh, weekly. And those samples are collected on Mondays, and they're tested for three indicator bacteria. That's total coliform, E. coli, and uh, fecal coliform. And then if any of those results exceed state standards, then a, a warning sign is posted. Uh, usually the results and the signs are posted about 24 hours after the sample is collected. And then if a beach does, we call it either exceeds or has a warning. It, the resampling is conducted on Wednesdays, and then that can be reposted before the weekend if the results change. So we um, sometimes the county does not do the sampling during the winter. We'll step in and help during those years if, if need be. But regardless, we, we look at the data every week. We analyze them statistically. If there's ever a um, situation where there's um, a pattern of repeated beach warnings, especially during dry weather, there is actually a bill that says we're supposed, there's a law that says we are supposed to go conduct a sanitary survey. I think that we're probably the only agency that even knows that law exists, but we do it. <laughs> and we'll go conduct additional sampling, or, or we, we have our biweekly creek data, so we can always go look at that. and. 
see if it looks like there was a spike in anything coming down the creek. Um, and so what we've seen is that over the past two years, uh, we've had about 50% fewer beach warnings at Arroyo Burrow and um, East Beach at Mission Creek during the, the drought conditions. And that's because um, there are fewer storms. I mean, the sampling's every Monday. Sometimes that's right after a storm. Sometimes it isn't. But even um, during dry weather, when there's lower base flow in the creeks, there's uh, fewer times when the lagoons are open and flowing directly out into the beach. And um, here's some data. This is going back to 1997. The blue line is the number of beach warnings per um, we call this the AB 411 season. It's, it's April 1st to October 31st, and that's really when the state says we have, the county has to do the sampling. We could call it the approximate summer months. Um, so the, the blue line is the number of warnings per year at Arroyo Borough Beach, and the red line is the number of warnings per year at East Beach at Mission Creek. And then the green bars are um, the rainfall inches in that previous wet season, so September, to, September through that season. And you can see it's not a perfect match, but most of the, the wet years have higher than average beach warnings at both of these beaches. And um, so there's more warnings even in the summers following these wet winters. And this is in contrast to um, Leadbetter and East Beach at Sycamore Creek, which have a lot a less to no response to the previous wet year. And that's because there isn't a a large creek, um, Sycamore Creek is often even dry, flowing down into the estuary during summer months. Um, Leadbetter is sampled near, a, um, well, here you can see this. Um, you can see the lagoons at Arroyo, at Arroyo Borough flows open the most frequently of our beaches. And partly that's due to the higher base flow in that creek compared to Mission, and partly that's due to just less sand being replenished on the beach as because there's the dredging and, and berm building at, at East Beach. Mission Creek, you can see that, that berm across the lagoon. These were all taken on the same day, um, I think April 2013. Leadbetter is sampled um, at the mouth of Honda Creek. And let's see, it's kind of right in there. So it's got this great sand berm, which really acts as a sand filter almost all the time. Um, I've seen a few pictures where it's, it's really blown out. And then Sycamore Creek here, it looks, um, it's, it is almost always closed here. It looks like it probably flowed fairly recently, but that's a very dry sand berm compared to what you would see up here at Arroyo Burrow. What? Excuse me? Um, this is... Um, Los Niños right there, and then this is um, the park, uh, this is like the playground right by the um, bathhouse. Yeah. No, that's not right. Yeah, okay. And what were you saying, Cameron? I was just going to also point out that Arroyo Borough, um, it has higher flow, but it's also, the mouth has been constrained there because the parking lot was built in what was historically the estuary there went across that whole opening and so um, in a natural setting without the parking lot there you would have more sand be able to build up there so you'd, and you'd have a larger lagoon area so you would have less breaching of the lagoon. And this, um, this, this is data from a statistical analysis we did in, in 2009 or in 2010 with the data up from 2001 to 2009. But we looked at the influence of the beach openings or the lagoon openings during um, dry weather. So this is all year, but, but not if there had been any rain in the previous um, 72 hours. And so for all of the beaches combined, you can see that the likelihood of exceedance is about 15% when the lagoon, lagoons are open and about 4% when the lagoons are closed. So um, you can see that even if, if there's a... Um, a really wet year, there's going to be more beach warnings even all the way through the, the summer following that year. And we want to update this analysis because we have six more years of data. I also wanted to take um, some time to follow up, since we're talking about the beach warnings, on the presentation that you received last month. That was a lot to digest, and um, we've gotten some questions, so I wanted to address them. First of all, I just wanted to show these were the most um, recent Heal the Bay grades. They came out um, 
since the last meeting, and they're based um, on the previous year. So this the summer dry would be um, summer 2013, and all of the all of the beaches received A grades, and this is true with. I think 95% of the beaches in California, I, um, due to the drought conditions, there's just a, a lot fewer beach warnings. And um, Arroyo Burrow uh, did well in winter dry and wet weather, whereas um, East Beach didn't do as well during wet weather. And, and these beaches tend to kind of flip around. Um, we don't see a yearly re repeat of these F or D grades at either of these beaches, but I think sometimes it's just whether the, that particular beach happened to be flowing more on, on Mondays when the samples were collected or not. Um, going into um, reviewing the results that were presented by Dr. Irvin from UCSB, they, he presented a lot on watershed-wide uh, source tracking, but one of the key findings was that there was a lot of this DNA, um, this specific marker for dog waste, found at Arroyo Burrow, and that included in the creek, um, within the lagoon, and in the surf zone at the beach. And after conducting some outreach to some of the creekside residents, the dog marker decreased in the creek. And that was a really exciting result. Um, but, and I think this is where some misunderstanding could have taken place, the results did not show that um, the dog marker was solely responsible for beach warnings. and they found um, the dog marker was present in the surf zone when the creek was not flowing, when the lagoon was not open, and there were no beach warnings. So taking the dogs off of Arroyo Burrow Beach would get rid of that dog marker signal in the surf zone, but it wouldn't get rid of the um, beach warnings. And also the outreach did not dis decrease the um, FIB indicator bacteria concentrations. And this is just a... a visual for, um, here's the Aroboro estuary, there's the sampling point where the weekly sample is collected, and the current goes from west to east. So uh, dog waste that, um, dog waste that is, goes directly into the surf zone in the off-leash area really is going to get washed away from that sample point and isn't even going to be collected there. Dog waste that's upstream of the sample point um, and the on-leash area, probably there is less of it because it's the on-leash area. I think there are fewer dogs in general. And it's probably pretty well diluted by the time it gets down to that sample area. And that's in contrast to the dog waste um, in, that's in the creek, the lagoon, and maybe in this lower lagoon area that comes right out at this point and gets swept right into the sample zone. That's at least the goal of setting that sample zone is to really collect what is coming out. Um, and that's so that that waste can get picked up. Uh, the waste coming out of the lagoon there can get picked up in that sample site. So I hope that that, we can take questions at the end, but I hope that addresses some of the questions that have come up. Um, On to the, fir the first flush storm monitoring. It was a very late first flush. Uh, we did our usual four integrator sites, and we also collected runoff at four sites where um, runoff enters the bird refuge. and. As usual, we found low levels of most of our pollutants, low toxicity. Most pesticides were not detected, but we do have concern about some exceptions. And we found um, three compounds. Uh, I'm gonna t this slide has the first two, and then I'll talk about the third. Dichloran, dichloran uh, was, it's a pyrethroid. It was found at all the sites that we tested. And it's a fungicide used on food crops. It's not anything you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or OSH. So, I'm, su I'm suspicious about these results, and we will continue to test for this. We've, we've tested for pyrethroids a lot before, but dichloran has not usually been included in the suite, or if it has, we haven't found it. So that just makes me skeptical. And we're finding it in you know, all of our different sites, all different land uses. Sumithrin is a pyrethroid that we found at six sites, including bird refuge, including two that go into the bird refuge, and also in the last summer when we sampled at the bird refuge for sediment, we found it there. And also, it, it hasn't been included typically, so we don't have a, a big database on what we've um, found or not found before. But we did do some um, investigation as soon as we got the results. It's, it's used a lot in mosquito abatement products and household pest control, termite control products, but none, none has been used by vector control um, for years, if ever, that compound, and none has been um, registered by any major pesticide user in the county. And so, again, I'm suspect, are these real results, are these laboratory errors, and um, we'll be continuing to investigate that in the coming year. 
And then there was another um, pesticide, pesticide that we tested for the first time, and this is one of the neonicotinoid pesticides. And um, this one is called, we tested for three of them, and two were not found anywhere. Uh, we only tested these at our main integrator sites, and it was found in all four sites. And this one I am concerned about. Again, we would do additional testing to make sure these results are real. Um, but this is, it is in, in hundreds of products, including many that you can buy at Home Depot, and um, also used in agriculture and, and turf and grass. So it, it could be used everywhere. I think it's used in really large um, volumes in the U.S. And it's thought to be partially or very strongly responsible for colony collapse disorder in honeybees. And then there is some um, protest as to some of the results that have been produced, and some of those protests come from the producers of the compounds themselves. So I think this is, um, we'll get answers to this in the next couple years. I mean, there's very recent articles on this topic. And we'll conduct, conduct additional testing in wet and dry weather. And then the bird refuge. Um, you know, we've been testing weekly to monitor our pilot project, the aeration project, uh, project, but also to look at seasonal patterns. And um, this is, this is interesting. We have uh, temperature um, over the past six months and conductivity over the past six months. And you can see a definite seasonal pattern. It's, it's warmer, it's colder, it's starting to warm up again. And then conductivity as the bird refuge evaporates. Um, conductivity is a proxy for salinity. It just gets saltier and saltier over time. And then this was our one big storm and filled up with a, a lot of fresh water. And then it's starting to evaporate again. But this is really different than the pattern that we see for, or the lack of pattern that we see for dissolved oxygen. And here we see, um, you know, monthly to bi-monthly to bi-weekly, uh, it's from algae blooms. So we'll have really high levels of dis dissolved oxygen when we've got big blooms going. And then you can see they're dying off and, and the microbes are um, uh, using up all the oxygen as they're, as they're um, metabolizing the decaying algae. And uh, last year we had a, about a month where we had really high concentrations of a zooplankton called Daphnia that were able to finally consume all the algae that was present and the water got really clear. It was, um, you could see the bottom. And we were um, wondering if that would happen again this year and that hasn't happened. And then over the two years that we've been doing this, there haven't been any major stink events. And this is despite some really intense colors um, when it turned really pink and red last, uh, late last summer. There was a, an earthy, garlicky, cheap seafood was how it was described, um, odor, but it wasn't, we didn't have any calls. We had calls about the color, we didn't have any calls about the odors. So um, we have yet to have all of our probes and our sampling in there during one of these major events. Finishing up um, our, our costs uh, for labs, our Ellister lab, outsource lab and equipment are projected to cost 70,000. We'll, um, our next steps will be to carry out the research plan, uh, develop more outreach for the Arroyo Burrow and the, the dog results, and consult with our regional board. And um, next time you'll hear from me will probably be with the annual report. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Mr. Moldaver? Uh, thank you, Dr. Murray. Uh, if uh, our liaison, uh, Councilman Hart, doesn't have a question, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, for, 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 first of all, the ratings about the beach closures um, that you referenced about halfway through, uh, th those are lagging indicators for readings that they claim they had the year before? Correct. They've compiled all of the data that the counties have submitted um, for the previous year. So, so, so that means if someone sees a sign posted in the community, um, unless there's a recent emergency reading, it's actually for readings that happened a year ago. Oh, um, let me clarify. The signs that are posted at the beaches are based on the weekly sample or the resample result. So they're okay. either um, 24 to 72 hours old. Okay, but... The but, other grades I was talking about were the Heal right. the Bay Beach Report card. Um, okay, that, that was my one thing. The, the other thing which I think I mentioned last month with uh, Dr. Holden's research associate is um, with these chemicals working their way into the water and the local food chain from who knows where, um, have you considered having someone from your team uh, volunteer to uh, guest lecture part of a class 
for the Green Gardener program at City College, where the word would get out very quickly throughout the entire industry that, you know, if you're certified or hope to be certified, you probably want to stay away from this chemical, whether you can legally buy it or not. And I think that would be a very positive, low-key way of getting the word out uh, to a wide range of people who may be using it inadvertently and not realizing that it might cause long-term damage. I think that is an excellent idea, and I think we'll definitely be following up. We can develop some outreach material that even at times when we can't attend the classes, you know, can be used. Well, and, and parenthetical to that, uh, if you do it, I, I would send out a parallel m memo uh, to the uh, area members of the American uh, Landscape Association, which is the landscaping version of the American Institute of Architects. So the word starts to filter down from the higher level practitioners to the contractors they use not to use it either. Excellent idea. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay, thank okay, you very thanks. much. This um, information was presented for action to us this evening, so. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move that the committee recommend to um, the City Council and the Parks and Recreation Committee um, that we approve and recommend implementation of the proposed research and monitoring plan for the fiscal year 2015 uh, as presented and summarized by Dr. Murray. I second. Oh, go ahead. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstain? No. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have the Creeks Division Enforcement Program update from Jim Rumley, Water Resources Specialist. Jim, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, generally, I come and speak once a year to the committee about our enforcement program. Um, and this year, I'm going to focus mainly on what's, what's happened and what's changed um, within the last year. Uh, there'll be a little bit of, of general information, maybe a repeat for some of you. But uh, if any of you have any general questions that I don't cover, please feel free to, feel free to ask. Oh, yeah. Uh, Title 16 of our municipal code deals with water pollution prohibited, and it gives our enforcement program uh, the authority that we, we look for. Uh, this title covers all types of illicit discharges. Pretty much anything other than, than clean water discharged through the storm drain system is a violation of Title 16. This includes construction runoff, um, all types of washing, whether soaps are used from commercial property, um, all types of mobile business washing, whether soaps are used or not. Um, any type of vehicle leaks, mostly this is hydrocarbons. And any illegal dumping is also prohibited. There's a couple ways to report water pollution. One of them is through our enforcement line. And that phone number is 897-2688. And it's answered during Creeks Division's regular business hours. It's our goal to investigate all calls that we receive on the same day that we receive them, well, really immediately, but uh, definitely uh, the same day we receive them. And actually, for the last two years, we've been able to achieve that goal and respond the same day to all of the, the calls. And a new way, a relatively new way, to report water pollution is through the city's internet page, the city's homepage. Um, and I'll escape out of here and, and kind of walk through that, if I can. So from the city's home page, you can hover over How Do I? And there's an option, Report Pollution. And by clicking on that, there's a online form down at the bottom of the page where you can enter information. And you can remain totally anonymous. You can even upload photos that you would take of the, 
of the uh, violation that you see. And when you hit submit, it'll go to a couple of people in Creek's division. It goes to me and also our outreach coordinator, Liz Smith. We get that immediately in our inbox. So that's a, a new way to report pollution. And this is a chart of, of who's calling to report illicit discharges. And most of our discharges, it's a fairly equal distribution between Creeks Division staff, other city staff, and residents. And a smaller portion, about 4% this year so far, comes from other agency staff. And this includes nonprofit organizations, but, but mostly the, um, the other agency that we receive calls from is the county. People will call the county reporting, and it's actually in the city, and they'll transfer it over to us. So every call that we receive, we group it into one of these categories. And I won't go through all of them, but uh, it's interesting to note that, that construction, um, commercial and industrial and residential make up around 70% of all the calls that we receive. And uh, commercial industrial, that includes all retail and, and restaurants. And also uh, industrial discharges as well, of course. And so now I've just got uh, several photos of calls that we received this year. All of these photos are from this year, or this fiscal year. And this is a fairly atypical example of commercial washing because of all the foam. This is a, a real easy one to spot. Um, but uh, most of the time, we'll see washing discharges without soap. Um, but those are, those are um, a violation as well. This was from a large parking lot with a, a mobile washer. This is a residential winemaking waste. Um, this gentleman uh, finished um, with his winemaking operation and thought it would just be not a big deal to, to put it out into the street. Um, and after talking to him, we, we uh, decided next time it was perfectly reasonable to, for him to put this in his landscaping. And um, we, we generally um, find that most people um, don't know that what they're doing is, is a violation. So we, we see very few repeat offenders, which you'll see a little bit later when I um, talk about uh, warning letters versus the actual fines that we issue. Here's a, an example of a paint spill. A resident spilled some latex paint in the street and uh, didn't have time to clean it up, and they just decided to hose it down, which is, you know, it actually took them a lot longer to clean up this mess uh, than it would have if they would have just cleaned it up immediately. But fortunately, none of this actually made it into a storm drain. Uh, here's an example of um, some really ineffective best management practices being used. You can see in the picture on the left, there's just uh, a few sandbags, and uh, the heavily sedimented discharge is, is just bypassing them. And you can see old Mission Creek on the right. It's um, turned pretty murky. This is a colored concrete discharge. Um, a lot of times when, when concrete trucks will show up to a work site, they'll have a concrete washout area. Um, but from some of the smaller sites or some of the commercial sites, there is no washout area, and the, the driver still needs to wash out their equipment. Um, in this case, they didn't have anything to capture that discharge. Um, some of the, the more responsible contractors will have a wet-dry vacuum with them or some type of equipment to, to direct that um, discharge into the, the landscaping. Here's an apartment complex that had a washing machine um, connected to um, the sewer, but the sewer was blocked, and so it was going right into the, the, the parking lot. And this is a fairly typical example of what we, we see when we get a report of a, a mobile washer. Uh, a couple guys just washing a car and uh, not capturing the water, and it's flowing right into the storm drain. And for this call, the contractor was, um, was doing work on a driveway apron, replacing the driveway apron, and they did some saw cutting. And they didn't really have anything set up to, to capture the discharge. So uh, the, f the photo on the right shows that, um, that slurry going right into the storm drain. This is a table uh, summarizing the violations that we've received over the last five years. 
and we're pretty much right on track for this year um, compared to, rel to, to, to um, previous years. 212 calls received so far through early June. And you can see notices of violation are, are down a little bit. But um, hopefully we won't get any more this year, but we probably will. And so the other part of our enforcement program is cleaning up illegal dumping and encampments. And most of the encampments and illegal dumping sites that um, are reported to us are actually discovered by Creeks Division staff while they're out and about in the creeks or um, just doing routine inspections of some of our hot spots. But we do receive many reports from residents and other city staff, and we rely on those to let us know when they see stuff. And unfortunately, we rarely find the people that are responsible for illegal dumping, um, but we, we can always get it cleaned up. We've got a, a really good contractor that's very responsive and can get anything cleaned up within a couple days. So some of the hot spots where we, we can go every week and find trash. Um, Mission Creek is by far the most impacted creek. There's many sites along there that are used for camping and, and unfortunately dumping. Um, also in the lower watersheds at Laguna Channel and Sycamore Creek near the railroads, real hot spots. And most recently, um, there's a really great camp spot, unfortunately, um, at Arroyoboro Lagoon. Nice oak woodland where we see a lot of camping, and it's another spot where uh, um, we got to get cleaned up very frequently. And now the next few slides are just some examples of the trash that we've seen this year in encampments. This is an abandoned encampment. Uh, the people were gone, but uh, they left quite a mess here. This is um, on the freeway side of, of Mission Creek right at Victoria. This is an encampment that's pretty active under talent um, near Oak Park or at Oak Park. Here's a camp. This is at Mitchell Terrena Street on the bank um, right at the bridge over Mission Creek. And this is an illegal dumping spot and a hangout spot um, on, along Upper De La Vina on Mission Creek. And what you're looking at here, these are spent whipped cream canisters or nitrous oxide that have um, presumably been used for huffing. This is, this is my favorite one here. This is a, a living room set up near City College in Honda Creek. And this is an encampment um, just upstream of the freeway in Arroyo Borough where the concrete channel is. And uh, there was a guy that was, was, was living in the, the concrete channel. Not really where you want to be if a storm event comes through there, but uh, he didn't have to deal with that this year. And these are a couple of mattress, our mattress in a box spring dumped in Sycamore Creek. These were um, originally placed by the trash can and they got tossed into the creek So when we find an encampment, it's the city policy that, that we give occupants 48 hours notice to, to get their stuff, anything that they want, get that out of there before uh, our contractor comes in and cleans it up. This is what the cleanup notice looks like. Um, at the top, we can, we can write when we posted it, and we give the occupants the date and time, uh, approximately, when we'll be there to clean it up. And then it also gives the, the relevant codes for why they can't be there. And we list the enforcement hotline in case they have any questions. So currently our contractor is charging us $102 per site, per creek or beach site, for a cleanup. And it doesn't matter what's there. It's 102 bucks flat rate. And this is going to go up to $104 next year to match the city's increase in uh, minimum living or the, the living wage. So far through the end of March this year, we've had 658 sites cleaned. Um, this includes creek sites and beach sites. Uh, there's five beach sites that we have cleaned every Friday. And it's been, we've, they've collected 83,800 pounds of trash through end of March, or 127 pounds per site. And here's just some numbers for the types of items that have been collected. Our contractor keeps track of everything they, they take in a spreadsheet. So far, through the end of March, 
75 bicycles, 118 grocery carts, 44 mattresses, 446 paint cans, 13 appliances, 138 blankets or bedding, um, 78 pieces of furniture, 193 plastic bags, and uh, 321 of the, of the sites um, had some type of feces. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Jim. Any guests? Yeah. Mr. Moldaver. Uh, great report. Uh, so they really collected last year over 40 tons of debris uh, adjacent to the creeks. And, and that was after the residents had a two-day notice to uh, move their stuff and vacate. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not all from encampments, um, but that number, and we've, we've been averaging um, for many years now 100,000 pounds a year. And that includes, like if our contractor goes to a creek site, um, that includes items in the creek, but also on the bridge, because we, we feel like anything that's on the bridge, left on a bridge, is going to eventually has a, a good likelihood of ending up in the creek. So, you know, the, the encampments are only posted when, when we see that there's someone actively occupying them and if there's, there's items of real value. Well, and if, if there was some way um, for Bob Samario to get some revenue out of this, you could station a, a, a police cadet uh, every evening at the uh, bridge uh, between um, uh, Alamar and Delavina uh, by Mission Creek and... Um, you not only find creative ways to make money for the city, but uh, the tagger gangs who congregate there and mark up the bottom of the bridge before they vandalize Ralph's and the other adjacent stores uh, it would probably be a little bit harder for them to operate. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we do request uh, police assistance occasionally. Um, some of the encampments that we find um, will be occupied by a, num by a number of individuals. And so when we, when we feel um, something might be unsafe, we will, we will request police assistance. But uh, um, we could also mention that, uh, that bridge at Alamar over Mission Creek as well. Thank you. I was out riding my bike along the backside of the bird refuge. I didn't know that trail had been opened you know, along the freeway. Do you know where I'm, ta do you know where I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. And you can go down, and there are some docks that go out onto the water. Yeah, definitely. There, it looked like at the farthest point there's a little footbridge, yes. but there was an encampment there. This okay. was a few weeks ago. I don't know if that's part of the area that yeah, you checked. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We can we can go out and, and check that one out. Um, we have seen people there before, um, but yeah, that that would be a good spot to not have someone camping there because it is right the inflow right into the bird refuge, for sure. I'll check that one out. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, um, we're very privileged. We not only have Councilman Hart with us tonight, but also uh, Councilwoman Murillo. And I was wondering whether she had any suggestions or comments um, either about the uh, water pollution studies from Dr. Murray or our, our staff report on uh, debris and trash uh, that was collected last year along city creek watershed's you may also be putting her on the spot because I think she just joined us i, I i'm not sure pe I'm not sure people at home realize what long hours members of council work and that e even when they're not speaking on screen they're often um, uh, at the meetings listening and taking notes so I always like to acknowledge uh, uh, our local government uh, whenever uh, they're present. Very good. Then if there isn't anything else, do we have a motion to adjourn? I'll, I'll second that motion, Madam Chair. Okay. <laughs> Great. Then all in favor? Aye. Then we are adjourned.